and defense, so it made sense to do something about animal weaponry, and it's very diverse, lots of cool things to talk about. We have one live animal we're going to meet at the end, but first we're going to talk about all this cool stuff. So, what would you like to talk about? Um, I can talk about horns versus antlers. Yes. So we'll start over here. So this massive um, contraption of a skull belongs to a bighorn sheep, and then I believe these are the teeny tiny antlers of a white-tailed deer <laughs> right over there. And while these two things serve the same purpose, right, um, often, well, hang on, let me backtrack a little bit. These serve the same purpose in many of the ungulates that have these, especially in the males, because males will use their horns or their antlers to compete for mates and to compete for resources. However, there is a difference between horns and antlers, especially when it comes to the sexes that have them. So in antlered critters like your elk, your deer, um, they only have antlers in males, right? So females lack these antlers. It's what we call sexually dimorphic. There's a change or a difference between male and female organisms. However, if you have horns, like bighorn sheep or bison, both male and females have horns, right? So they're not sexually dimorphic in that regard. Also, antlers are shed every year. They're extremely expensive, extremely energetically costly. So um, in, after the rut, after the males have used their antlers, um, they shed them off and it's kind of bloody and scary looking. And then in the spring, they start to regrow them. So they have to allocate these nutrients towards these pointy bits on their head every year. Whereas with many other critters, their horns just grow throughout their life. So it's a less of an immediate resource allocation and more of a long-term, slower resource allocation. Um, more like a more steady savings account and a not so steady savings account is how I like to think about it. The structure of the two differs as well. So antlers are just their bone covered in an epidermal lining, kind of like skin, basically. And that's called the velvet. That's that stuff that when it sheds, it looks bloody and scary and red. Um, whereas ant horns here are bone covered in a keratin sheath. So underneath the horn, or underneath the keratin sheath, you can see the bone, right? This is actually part of the animal's skull. And then once that animal dies, you can remove that tough keratin sheath. So that's the crucial difference between antlers and horns, this is the one that I like to remember the most, is the fact that horns are quite literally part of the skull, right? Whereas antlers come off every year. So I think those are pretty nifty. There is a couple exceptions because it's biology. So with antlered animals, she's right, most of them are mostly just the males that have antlers. However, in reindeer, males and females both have antlers. Oh, that's not good oh, Oops, I messed it up. Both the males and females have rain, or have most male and female reindeer have antlers. Um, males lose theirs in the fall, and females usually keep theirs through the year. Um, and then they, I think they continually grow, don't they, female reindeers? Or do they lose know. them once a year? I don't know. Okay, I'm pretty sure that they might lose them, but they they keep theirs through the winter. And it's um, the theory for the reason for that is you know males use it to fight each other for mates, and the females use it to fight each other off um, once they have their offspring to like for the small bits of grass that they can find in those really um, competitive and cold environments so they use them to defend resources for themselves and their young. So that's an interesting thing too because again there's always exceptions to the rule. But now we're going to do a brief cover of teeth and claws. We have some claws up here as well. So I grabbed a tooth and I, oh it's in my pocket, ha <laughs> This is a replica piece, it's a replica tooth of a tiger um, and this much of it is actually inside the jaw, like up inside, set in the root. And we've talked about teeth a lot last month, and so if you saw any of our posts, we talked about how some animals have teeth that are set into sockets and they're pretty securely set in the jaw. And then there's some animals like snakes and crocodiles and sharks who are not set super deep in the jaw, but that's because they continually lose their teeth throughout their lifetime, and so they, it's not a big deal if it gets pulled out because they'll just replace it. Now I'm gonna duck down because this is a rattlesnake skull and it's super cool. But the rattlesnake skull has teeth that are curved backward, and then it's got those big fangs right there. But you can see multiple fangs right there, the ones that deliver the venom, because those were back inside the skull. They need to grow out if they lost those first set of fangs. Now, with this lovely, amazing, um, this is the a saber-tooth cat. We don't have a specific species because there were lots of them. But 
A lot of people see these giant canines and think that they probably use these to slash at their food. And while that's the case, they are not very deeply rooted. Their root is only about this deep. And so just by the pure physics of something being longer with a lower root, the scientists theorize that they had to be very careful when they were slashing at their prey, because if they got sunk in too deep, their teeth might have just been broken or pulled off in general. So they had to, they probably used it for a quick slash, and then once their food was, or once they got it to stop running, or maybe to stop moving, then they were able to like deliver a killing blow, theoretically speaking. But they probably had to be pretty darn careful, because they're just so long, and they're pretty narrow. They are very dagger-like, they are serrated on the edge as well. But to be able to um, not have their teeth break, they probably had to be very careful in chasing it down and hunting their food. Now, their other teeth are also just made for shearing, so they are those carnivorous carnassials. Yes, that's the one we talked about in like, in later, earlier this summer, we talked about, carna or educator Emily talked about carnassials. So they are meant for shearing flesh, and then they've got these teeth here at the front, they're pretty, pretty small, meant for holding on to their food. Now, teeth are super amazing, and some animals have some pretty incredible teeth, and we'll talk about this lovely, awesome one here in a second, but I wanna talk about claws, because claws, are intense. Many animals in the animal kingdom have claws for different reasons. Claws that are often long like this and not particularly curved or sharp are often meant for digging. So this is the uh, part of the claws of a badger and uh, they use theirs to dig huge underground tunnels. So it makes sense for them to have these long claws. They can use them to deter predators just like your dog if you've ever been scratched by your dog. Chances are it hurt and you might have bled as well. So these can hurt predators, but most of the time these claws are not meant for offense or defense, rather they're meant for digging. And now we come to the offensive claws. These are the claws of a great horned owl. So nice sharp edges here, very curved, very strong feet. They have four toes, three forward and one back, although owls can actually flip their one of their toes to the back, so they get two forward and two back. But not only do they have these really, really sharp claws that are probably to almost an inch long um, along the curve, but their feet are extremely strong. So these, most owls and most birds of prey actually kill with their feet. Um, their beak is usually used um, either to sever the spinal cord or to just eat their food. Many birds of prey will kill with their feet, and what they do is they grab it and then they squeeze, and then you've been punctured multiple times. But most birds of prey have a very strong grip. Now, the average human, adult human, can squeeze their fist with up to 100 pounds of pressure per square inch, which sounds like a lot. Great horned owls, which on average weigh about three to five pounds, can squeeze with 500 pounds of pressure per square inch. It's five times harder than the average human. So they have quite a bit of weaponry that helps them. Now, owls will also um, can use this as, as defensive um, if they are being attacked by another bird, which is pretty rare because great horned owls in particular are kind of the top of the food chain. But they can use it as defense against other owls or other birds, um, but mainly they use this as offense to capture their food. All right, you wanna talk about tusks? Sure. So tusks are kind of like modified teeth, right? This is a warthog replica skull. Obviously they're not gonna be using these tusks to eat food. Like they're not gonna be chewing with these guys. Um, both male and female warthogs will have tusks. And again, males will use them to spar. Um, however, they also use them to dig. So warthogs uh, live um, underground part of the time. They have burrows under there, so they have their little piglets. I didn't know that, that's adorable, oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching like a bunch of warthog piglets like shoot out of a den hole. It's just the oh cutest thing you could ever like hope to see. But they use <laughs> these to help excavate those like den holes. So both Ow. males and females will use these. They'll stick their heads in the ground and kind of like toss it side to side um, and use them for digging. Now, other animals that also have tusks like these include hippos, right? So both male and female hippos have absolutely gargantuan tusks and really strong jaws. Um, and again, both males and females have these. Males use them for uh, defense and for sparring. And especially in hippos, like in the dry season, hippos are amphibious mammals. So they live in the water most of the time because their skin has to be kept wet or it's going to start cracking and getting gross and weird and bad. And so in the dry season, there's a bunch of hippos congregating in these small little like watering holes or pools and space and resources are super, super tight, right? And you want to defend your space, your resources so that you can get through the dry season. So if you're a male or a female hippo, you're going to use these tusks to fight. 
Um, and it is loud. It is scary. <gasps> it is bloody. Um, and these tusks are incredibly sharp. The other really cool thing about tusks that I actually didn't learn until a couple of years ago is that these are ivory. So if you are ho holidaying abroad once COVID is over and you can buy, you go to a stand and you see warthog tusks or hippo tusks or things like that for sale, do not purchase those because that is ivory. Um, so it is the same stuff that makes up elephant tusks. It's that very valuable material that contributes to a lot of illegal animal trade and poaching trade. Um, so if you are traveling abroad in places where things like this are for sale, do not participate in that. Um, and I think these can also come out as well, but these ones might not. I think we glued these might in. Glued in. <laughs> yeah, I think we glued these in because these kept falling out. But yeah, so these are both not only weapons for sparring, but they also make homes for these critters. That which is so cool. I didn't know that. Kind of cool. Really awesome. Yeah. So yeah, animal offense and defense is quite diverse. And we brought, of course, you know, we're a zoo. We have an animal to show you as well. Okay. But also think about uh, plant defense. Plant defense and offense is actually super complex and super amazing. So definitely look that up a little bit because there are literal plants that if they get bitten by one bug, they release a chemical that actually draws that bug's predator. So plants are not, or animals are not the only ones that have offensive and defensive capabilities. Plants do too. They're just, you know, slightly less, less well known to most of us. But the animal we're going to meet is an owl. But we're not meeting Gable the Great Horned Owl. We're meeting Scout the Screech Owl. Now, if you haven't seen him in a while, that's because Scout here had to have a doctor appointment. And I'll duck out of here behind him for a second. He had to have a doctor appointment because that eye that was damaged in his, um, uh, when he was hit by a car several years ago started to bother him more and more. Um, he couldn't see out of that eye anyway, but um, he started to eat less food and kind of indicate to us that something wasn't right. So we went to the vet, and the vet said that his eye was starting to swell. So he actually had that eye removed. And since that surgery, he's been doing so well. He's been doing so much better. He eats well. He's so much more active and calling. So this surgery was very good for him. Now, we wanted to bring him out just to show you that he's okay and also explain those changes in his face. But also, talk about how an animal this small can have intense offensive capabilities. Now, even though he's a little owl, he does have tiny little claws on his feet right there. And those little claws also help him kill his food. He usually eats things like mice, um, as well as small, other small mammals and even small birds. And even occasionally this, the small reptile. So they have quite an ability to eat a lot of different things and catch a lot of different things with those feet. But that beak is another thing that is quite intense. And he's very focused on the animals behind us. So let me see if I can get him to focus up here a little bit. How about he? <laughs> He's not, he, you know, you can't make oh, any animal just like that you don't big want foot? to, but maybe like we'll get rid foot? of the foot. There we go. Is that spooky? <laughs> what do you think? What do you think, Scout? Blood. He's like, there's so much stuff back here, there's not usually stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> big teeth. What do you think, bud? Uh, he may not turn around for now, so that's why we do have a skull to show you. So, I think he's looking at the giant ram right now. <laughs> what is this? Owls and other birds of prey, like I mentioned earlier, not only do they have those intense feet, but they have sharp curved beak. It's a part of what makes them a bird of prey. So this sharp hooked beak here, and I'll give it to Emily to bring it up nice and close. Oops, as I try not to knock over the warthog skull. This sharp hooked beak not only allows them to deliver a killing blow if their feet haven't already done the job, but it also allows them to tear up bits of their food, allowing them to eat larger things. And now you can see his face as well as his little beak. Now I do say little beak because it looks very small with all of his feathers surrounding it. But if you notice on this skull right here that Miss Emily's holding, this line of the mouth goes all the way back here. So owls actually have quite, and most birds of prey have quite a larger, it's called a gape, quite a larger mouth than it looks with that little beak. And many birds actually do as well. So that beak is both offensive and defensive. They can use it against each other. However, in the wild, especially on raptors, if you do come across one that's been hit by a car, chances are it's less likely to bite you than it is to try to grab you with its feet because again, those feet are much stronger than their beak. Now, again, a, a scout here is an Eastern screech owl and screech owls are actually found, there's two different kinds, there's Western and Eastern screech owls. Eastern screech owls are found pretty much everywhere east of the Rocky Mountains and the western screech owls are found west of the Rocky Mountains. So in Montana, we do happen to have both. Scout here is an eastern screech owl. Um, and there's 
very few differences between them. Size is one of the differences. Um, screech owls can be multiple different colors, which also confuses the issue between western and eastern screech owls. They can be grayish, like Scout is here, or they can be like a reddish color. And that can even happen, I've been told, within the same brood or the same um, nest of chicks, because it helps them. They usually live in mixed tree forests, which means that um, they, you know, if there's, you know, five, four chicks hatched out, two of them are gray and two of them are red, that means there's less competition for trees because some of them will blend in better to one tree than the other tree. So they've got some beautiful coloration as well. Now part of their defense that they need as a small owl, even though they are a predator, they consume a lot of other animals, part of their defense is that coloration, that camouflage, because they need Let's to be able to hide. House. Let's go back in house. All right, we'll go ahead and say goodbye to Scout, because he is still, we're still making sure that we um, ease him into programming, but we hope that you have enjoyed learning about some very quick animal offense and defense. Now, keep an eye on our Twitter, our Facebook, and our Instagram, and our, even our YouTube channel for all things defense and offense this, this month. We've been doing some really cool research, finding out some really interesting things about animals, and so you can find us on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube at Zoo Montana, and of course, you're following us on Facebook if you're seeing this video. So, hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you enjoyed looking at these cool bio facts. If you have any questions, submit them into our comment. If you have something you want to learn about via a Facebook Live or a different video, drop them in the comments as usual. And check out later today, we'll have a new Zoo Clues video going up. Anything else you want to add? I don't think so. All right, friends. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your Saturday. And stay warm, stay safe, and take care of each other. Bye, everyone.